Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all doing? So, uh, so welcome. Uh, I, uh, I mentioned in my email to the panel that uh, every year getting that first workshop going on time is a challenge, and boy, we're definitely, <laughs> definitely way, way off. But um, we're going to do our best nonetheless. What I'd like to do is I'm going to start on this end uh, and ask each to introduce themselves. Uh, and then when we get to Peter, uh, Peter's going to go first. I am going to use a timer um, visually uh, because I think that it's uh, helpful. We all get caught up with things we're saying. It's hard to keep on time. Uh, my goal would be if we all kept to the timers that we can have a uh, Q&A then afterwards. So that's the goal. But I, you know, we got an amazing panel here. Uh, rather than me introduce them and take the time to do that, I do encourage you to look at what's been handed out. But just to get us going, Please introduce yourself. And William, I apologize. It looks like we didn't get your name uh, here. But. I'll just take Peter's. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Bill Artis with Energy Project Consulting. Uh, we're a Long Island based technical consulting firm that specializes in commissioning and energy modeling. Great. Jay Egg with Egg Geothermal. I had my uh, geothermal consultant, uh, written a couple of books from McGraw Hill, and uh, get up pretty much all around the U.S., uh, but spending a lot of I'm up here in New York because you guys are doing so much good. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jennifer Garvey. I am the Long Island Development Manager for Orsted. We are a renewable energy company and we're working on um, we're building offshore wind in New York State. Great. Good morning, everyone. I'm John Franceschina. I manage the PSEG Long Island Energy Efficiency Programs. Uh, Peter Gollin, LIPA trustee. LIPA exists and owns the energy distribution <laughs> system, and it, which is run by PSEG. And we watch them and give them goals and pay them to do a good job, which they do. So today we're talking about the future of energy on for Long Island, but really it's a sort of a global change in our energy mix. We have, as you just heard the names of uh, introductory-wise, we have a great panel here. Uh, we have a ton of questions, but first let's get some uh, uh, presentations. So we thought that it would be awesome if Peter could give us the sort of uh, kickoff and overview of these issues. And as I said, Peter, nothing personal, but I am going to use the timer. Okay, uh, I'll go, real, go. I'll go real, real fast. First, I have to say that what I'm presenting is my own opinion rather than LIPA's, although it, I think everything is consistent with LIPA's policy. Uh, so why do we want to decarbonize? And I'm going to give you basically the, co the content, table of contents of what everybody else is going to say. Next slide. We want to decarbonize, which means stop using carbon-based fuel, oil, natural gas, coal, because carbon dioxide is greenhouse gas. It causes climate change, global warming. <coughs> All right, so the... Is it cooperating? No, it's not, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay, so as, as the climate warms, the air land gets drier, Agriculture suffers. You get more fires, as you see in California. Agriculture is harder because the land gets drier faster. You have droughts. You have storms like Superstorm Sandy. None of these are good. Where does carbon come from? Well, in New York State, you can see the use of carbon-based fuel, mostly gasoline and transportation, is 48%. In buildings, it's 14%, probably mostly natural gas. In residential buildings, 20%, a mix of fuel oil and natural gas. And the heating fuels on Long Island are natural gas, which doesn't show up here for some reason, is 49%. Fuel oil is 40%. So if we're so talking about these issues. We're talking about these issues, buildings, okay? 82% of our carbon emissions in New York State come from two sources, transportation and buildings. Next slide. Now, some people will tell you that natural gas is the be-all and the end-all of, of clean energy. That's a total lie. Why? Well, when you burn it, you get carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas. And when you get leakage of not natural gas, which is methane, from the well, from the fracking well, along the pipelines, from the pipes in the street, you also have considerable contribution to climate change because natural gas is a far worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So you get as much from the leakage, climate change from the leakage of natural gas as you do from the burning of it. So the solution is, first you've got to put everything on electricity. Generate the electricity from offshore wind, 
no greenhouse gas emissions generated from solar on rooftops, from solar farms on buildings. Again, no greenhouse gas emissions. And you electrify transportation. I now have an electric car. I charge it at home. You also need charging stations on the road. When everybody leaves here, I would like you to find the manager of this building and tell them they need charging stations for electric vehicles. <laughs> Anybody who drives in from far east end should be able to recharge to get home. It's a long distance to push your car. <laughs> so that's sol solution three, is make buildings more efficient so they use less energy. Solution four, heat them with electrically powered heat pumps, either getting the heat from the outside air, like an air conditioner run backwards, or from the ground where it's a constant 50 degrees or so, and run them the other way around in the summer as air conditioning. You're doing well on time. Doing good. <laughs> okay. This is from June 1988. Global warming has begun, experts tell us. So we had years. decades to get things fixed. This is from last summer, climate change, hot house earth risks even if carbon dioxide emissions are slashed. Things are getting worse, and they're getting worse faster. Because we have, as a, as a, as a species, we've done squat. So what's happened here? It's now warmer. There will be more days over 90 degrees than previously. You can remember colder winters. Our seasons have shifted. Spring is earlier. Summer is hotter. It rains more, and the, what rain we have is heavier. The sea has risen. Beaches are getting shorter because as the water comes up, beach slopes, comes closer. The sea has risen 13 inches since 1880. This is a lot. Marine life has changed. There are no lobsters here anymore. It's too warm for them. They've moved up to Maine and they're moving to Canada. Or at least the, indus the industry is the set. The lobsters aren't moving. They, they crawl. Fish are moving. The lobster industry is moving. And what's not here is, of course, that as this continues, agriculture here will suffer. I don't know what it's like to run a vineyard in South Carolina. At some point, well, I think we'll be like South Carolina, and the vineyards will move up to Maine. So what's, what's the plan? The plan is, I'll do this in time sequence, get 6,000 6, megawatts of solar, distributed solar, in New York State. Long Island has about I would say maybe 100 megawatts. So it's a, it's a John will these, This is an ambitious goal. A very ambitious goal. This is by 2040. This is just enacted into law. But of course, changing the law into action is another kettle of fish and fire. We need to get energy storage by 2030. Why? The sun doesn't shine at night. The wind doesn't always blow. If you can stockpile the energy when it's available, you can use it when it's not. We need to get electricity from renewable energy, from wind, from the sun, and use it, of course, use it more efficiently. This is just, the just recently passed Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Next slide. So, we have no time to waste. The UN report that just came out last month, China and the United States, the two biggest polluters, are further increasing, increasing their carbon dioxide emissions last year deeper and faster cuts are now required. And this is the So we have no time to waste. We are in a climate emergency. And you can't continue business as usual. Things must change. And you can either be part of the change or you can suffer the results of continuing to do things that are continuing to destroy our planet. Thank you. All right. Peter, uh, don't go anywhere yet. So uh, oh, yeah, I know you, your, your background, you're an engineer, right? Physicist. Physicist. Former recovering physicist. So I just, wanted to, <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to thank you for introducing that technical term of we haven't done squat. So that's <laughs> you're letting us in on your expertise there. So uh, I was paying attention to your slide at the beginning where it said five things that we needed to do. Did you hit all five? No, you caught me there. Okay. The fifth one is also important but not relevant to this particular workshop. And that's eat less meat. Ah, industrial you. agriculture, industrial livestock, enormous farm, farming operations from cattle, pigs, and to a lesser extent chicken are enormous releases of, releases of methane. If they, I, if they were a nation, they would probably be up in the top five 
for a while. So it's healthier to eat less meat and better for the planet. Okay, we didn't hear the timer go off, but it just stopped now. So great job here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Jennifer, it's your call if you'd like to do it from the table or stand up. Okay, so I'll on this side. I do have the timer. I'll show you at certain point. Uh, so you already introduced yourself. We just found out from that earlier slide that we're really counting on wind to be a big part of this solution. So tell us about it. Wind. Okay. Right. So the good news is um, it's been in a, an incredible year for offshore wind. The industry is really um, taking off in an in 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 astounding way. Um, and so just to, to dive right into it, um, the next slide here. Um, all right, just a brief view of like who the heck are we? So <laughs> I mentioned I'm Orsted. We are we are a renewable energy company. We are the global leaders in offshore wind. Orsted invented offshore wind back in 1991. They were the first to put turbines in the water off the coast of Denmark. Obviously, they've never looked back, and today uh, they own, they have constructed an, and operate about 25% of the more than 4,000 offshore wind turbines that are in operation around the globe today. Um, we have a partner for our projects here in the Northeast, Eversource. Can you all hear me back there? I yes. probably am not yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll stand up. Okay. Um, so our, our partner in this is Eversource. Eversource is... Um, New England's largest energy provider, actually, they are a premier transmission builder and they have 100 years of experience working in the Northeast. So together we have really just excellent expertise and resources to deliver projects for New York and we're delighted to, be, to, to have this opportunity. Um, so just a you know, big picture for a second, a reminder of <coughs> why offshore wind, why is this such an important opportunity for us? Why is everyone so excited about it? Why is the market going crazy? Um, and you know, this story tells such a complete picture, really. On the on the on your left hand side, um, we see just you know the energy demand that we have here in the Northeast. I mean, this is we are big energy, a region with major energy needs, particularly that corridor from Boston down to down to Washington D.C. area. A large percentage of the, the nation's population lives in this right in this corridor, so we have enormous energy needs. Uh, we also have an incredible wind energy resource, a naturally naturally occurring energy resource right off our shores. This middle slide here is a look at the average wind speed rates along the coast. And as you can see, we get in the, as we are, you know, Long Island and upwards, we're, we're, we're getting into like the darker purple and red, and that means really strong wind. Um, we can also access this, this, uh, this resource cost effectively because we have a shallow, shallow waters, or considered shallow, I realize some, some folks might off the cuff think it's deep, but shallow waters along our outer continental shelf, which means that we can build this infrastructure cost effectively and you know, deliver um, mm -hmm. pricing that makes this an acceptable solution to us here in the Northeast. For the next slide. Um, the other thing is the technology is improving at just a great rate. And so you see here the evolution of our two lines over the past few years. And this is an industry that you know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not even 30 years old yet, but the, the, the technology is quite mature now. Um, and you see how, I mean, Block Island here has even been outpaced by two larger turbines since that installation was completed in 2016. Uh -huh. So it gives you a sense of just how quickly this technology is moving. The technology is getting, the, the, the turbines themselves are getting bigger, more powerful, and that means that um, two things. It's certainly good news from an environmental perspective. It's just a smaller footprint, less infrastructure that we need to install, and from a cost perspective, it's really driving the price <laughs> Um, all of these more powerful and Jennifer, when it says 500 feet high, that's out of the water, so it's another 100 and whatever to get it into the ground, is that right? Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the, the part you see below the water is even is, is also, you know, we're at 150 feet of water or so, and then depending on the technology, it can be, um, you know, there can be piles down into the, in, below, you know, below the, 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 the surface of the seafloor. So these are, in total, these are these are really Monsters. large pieces of equipment. They are, <laughs> yes. And I highly recommend a visit to the Block Island Wind Term, seeing as believing it's an incredible experience. Let's get the next slide. So um, I said the market was, you know, was really moving uh, in this industry, and this really gives you a great illustration of kind of what's happening, a snapshot of what's happening. The purple represents um, the, the goals that have been set by states in the Northeast. And the, the blue represents, you know, the how much capacity is already under contract in each of these states. New York, I think this slide is a little fuzzy, but New York here is all the way on your right hand side. And you see that New York has set the nation leading goal for, for offshore wind, 9,000 megawatts by 2035. So we are way out front on this issue. The governor has made this sort of a banner part of his, of his uh, energy future, his vision for the state for our energy future. Obviously we passed climate, nation leading climate legislation this, this year as well. 
Um, and so that means that New York's also really well positioned to get the largest piece of the supply chain pie, if you will. So there's a lot of economic opportunity that comes with this business. That's a part of why people are also very excited about it. Um, a lot of you know a lot of job opportunities and supply chain development generally that um, will revitalize ports, will just generally create jobs across the island, uh, upstate region. Uh, and so you know there's a lot to look forward to here, and you know New York intends to get as much of that business. Um, and just to, to drill, to highlight the two projects that we're working on for New York State, um, we have the South Fork Wind Farm, which is a project we've been working on for about two and a half years now. It's a project awarded by LIPA. We have a, uh, we have a, a power purchase agreement with LIPA for um, power that will be delivered to a substation in East Hampton, uh, and that's due to come online at the end of 2022. Um, that wind farm, all of our wind farms are located in an area that we have rights to way out uh, off the coast of Montauk. It's at the closest point, it's 30 miles from Montauk. Um, and then the Sunrise Wind Farm is a, a project that we were just recently awarded over the summer. That's power for over half a million people. Uh, that's a project that's due to come line at the end of 2024 and power that will be delivered directly into the grid here on Long Island uh, in Brookhaven in town. So, uh, you know, in two projects, we're up to over a thousand megawatts. So, I mean, when we say large scale clean energy, you know, it's a really exciting future for offshore wind. Wow, great stuff. So, uh, so phenomenal on the time. Can I throw a quick question? You can. So, <laughs> so you mentioned uh, job opportunities, and you know I, I commented on how big these things are. Clearly, these things don't just appear. There's a lot of work that has to go into this industry. Will there be significant job opportunities for Long Island? Obviously, we're not going to be manufacturing this equipment. But we would hope this is a job. Sure, yeah. I mean, the jobs, the numbers that we've put out there, you know, are in the range of like 800 um, direct jobs that will come from our projects, 1,200 sort of associated jobs coming from our project. And so when you think about what it takes to make this happen, um, you know, just, I mean, and it starts now, by the way. I mean, you know, I'm part, I'm part of a job, part of a team. You know, we've got a lot of planning. There's an enormous uh, permitting, um, you know, uh, process that we have to go to, which will take up a lot of folks, some of them in this room, um, who are working on these projects to try and, you know, do the planning, do the permitting. You know, there's, there's all of this work before we even get into the construction phase. And obviously, you know, we have, we need many hands to, to, to build our project offshore. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, an onshore connection that we have to build that will be a submarine, there's a cable that will come up, uh, that will come ashore that we'll have to bury in roads um, on Long Island here. So that will be, it's, it's typical buried utility work, but it's new work, you know, that wouldn't otherwise be happening. Um, and so that will be labor intensive as well. We have some, a substation to build, there's you know, grid upgrades to be had, and then we have to maintain our wind farm. And as part of the Sunrise Project, for example, we committed to um, locating the operations maintenance hub for not even just our Sunrise Wind Project, but our Northeast region generally in Port Jefferson. And so that's a place where people will come to work. Those are jobs that are emanating out of Port Jefferson. There's a, we call it, um, there's a, a vessel called the Service Operation Vessel. It's kind of like a hotel boat because when you work on the wind farm, you actually go live out there for at least you know two weeks at a time. And so this boat will, will come to Port of Port Jefferson, People will get on, they'll go out to the wind farm, you know, they'll be working, you know, every day at the wind farm and then they'll come back either by the big boat or by um, a smaller fleet of vessels called crew transfer vessels that will bring them to, um, back to either Port Jeff or Montauk or, you know, other other ports. But that's that's part of the big scheme that we have and we've got a lot of people to train to keep all of this um, infrastructure, to, to make sure we're ready for all this infrastructure when it comes up. Okay, great stuff. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so let's move on to our next presentation. We have uh, Jay and Bill. Who's coming next? John, I'll go ahead and go because I probably. You want to go? Yeah, I'll go. Yeah, sure. Bill, then. Bill. Bill. I'm kind of assuming John's going west since he's like controlling his computer. And yeah. I'm not going to be managed until we get him on his thing. I'll switch places with you, Bill, and I do have the timer Good. once you're ready to go. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I don't know if that's going to work. I'm going to try it. There we go. Just with that. All right. Okay, so my talk is going to be, uh, we probably should be about three days worth of seminars, condensed into about seven minutes on how to reduce building energy use and peak demand. Uh, if anyone wants a copy of the presentation to see me afterwards, I'd no problem send it out to you. But the uh, couple talking points that we're going to address, changing how we approach project design, understand the owner project requirements, 
that did high, uh, high performance design and then the business case for sustainability. Uh, when I talked to Peter about uh, being a speaker with this, he had asked about doing um, a couple of just to talk about tightening up building envelopes, how to reduce the energy use, but this is really not a technology or any, any solution that's going to come from a single component within these buildings. Uh, high performance building starts at the design phase and it requires an integrated process between the owner and the design team and developing the owner's goals for sustainability. So how do we reduce the building energy use? First is developing a document called the owner's project requirements. This is essentially a written document that defines all of the owner's goals, form, function, and budget for project, documents it with the design team so that everyone's on the same page. And that's where sustainability and energy efficiency goals should be documented. Uh, next piece is we need to look at designing buildings as an environment and not just a combination of systems and assemblies that are thrown together. All of these components are going to interact and trade off uh, performance with each other. So when we're looking at energy efficient design, we have to look at the whole building holistically and not just at a component level. This also is a big impact on indoor environmental comfort and thermal comfort within buildings and how the occupants um, are exposed to these systems in the building as well. And lastly, we have accountability and verifiable performance criteria, which is the biggest piece because it's one thing to say we're designing a high performance building, it's another to actually prove that you built a high performance building. <coughs> so the owner's project requirements, uh, typically developed by a commissioning provider who uh, is separate from the architect and engineering team, or ideally is separate, and they're really acting as more of the owner's technical representative. So um, I'm sure people have seen a couple uh, memes or pictures on the internet like this where it just jokes about what the owner wanted, what the design team put together, what was actually built in the field, and really what you wind up with is the owner got something that they didn't want. Commissioning design to prevent that, and the OPR is a document that helps make sure that this does not happen. Within the OPR, uh, this is where you also want to define project budgets and the business aspects for the building that uh, these systems are supporting. Because it's one thing to say we want to design a very high efficient building, but if it's way out of budget and it's not going to get built, it's really going nowhere at that point. So all the energy efficiency and sustainability issues need to fit within the business case of the building and within that budget. Here's an example of a um, requirement matrix from an OPR document that we have put together. Just to give you an idea of some of the things that are looked at. This goes beyond more than just energy and uh, HVAC and lighting and building envelopes. Oftentimes you can include different things like aesthetic, security, uh, non-energy benefits. Right? But the idea is that you're documenting all the requirements for form, function, and economy, and back it up with facts, concepts, and the needs and justification for all this. Moving into how to start a project, um, how we start a project is going to depend on what stage of, of the building's life cycle we're in, whether it's a existing building major renovation, existing building uh, with inoccupancy or occupied um, phase improvements, or a out of the ground new construction project. However, all of these establishing an OPR at the beginning, if it's an existing building, this document is typically called a current facilities requirements document, but uh, seeks to serve the same purpose. For high performance design guides, and these are some references that can be used by design teams, by owners, above and beyond what the minimum energy code requirements are for New York State, which by the way, the energy code is the worst performing building you can legally build. So complying with the energy code does that mean you're doing anything great, it just means you're complying with the minimum performance criteria. So these documents listed, such as the ASHRAE Advanced Energy Design Guides, which is a great resource, ASHRAE.org, uh, ASHRAE is the organization that develops many of the energy standards and mechanical standards that are adopted in local building codes. Uh, ASHRAE.org, they also have a local chapter here too, you can check them out at ASHRAELI.com. But they have different design guides for different schools. Uh, if anyone is involved with school work, they just came out with a K through 12 design guide, which is a great reference to use for those types of projects. You have the New York State Stretch Energy Code, which is um, uh, online now, available through New York State's website and through NYSERDA. New York City is also adopting this as their standard energy code going forward in 2020. I believe that's going to be effective in March. You also have ASHRAE 90.1 2019, which is a more recent version of the ASHRAE 90.1 document, which is energy efficiency in commercial buildings that's in the energy code, and ASHRAE 100, which is a standard for existing buildings. All of these provide guidelines and methodology for focusing on performance versus prescriptive requirements. And what we mean by that is actually measuring energy performance of a proposed building in design rather than just meeting a bunch of minimum efficiency requirements that are in the code, which would be prescriptive requirements. 
Yeah. Billy, you're doing great. Got two minutes. Two minutes left. All right, I only got 20 slides left. Um, <laughs> slides of design. The big takeaway here is that if you're building a new construction building, the most impact at the least cost you're going to have is at the beginning of the project. Once you get out of schematic design, the efficacy of anything you do is going to be diminished. So incorporating things like energy modeling to look at different proposed systems and design is going to yield the best results. And this is from a uh, study done by the Department of Energy. Energy modeling typically, and this is based off of uh, uh, fees for modeling based on percent of uh, gross construction costs, typically pays back within a couple months. So you can find things by doing energy modeling design that will pay back very quickly. And this is very simple changes to equipment configurations, lighting power density, building insulation at that point. Because then you've got a blank canvas and the incremental costs for things that early in a project are not necessarily as large, but if you wait to improve an envelope insulation uh, when the building's in occupancy, that's a very cost intensive measure and typically doesn't have a good payback period. With this too, also look for target value design, which uses energy models to improve performance without any uh, negative impacts to budgets, um, and also focus on life cycle costing. Next, we'll be focusing on load reduction, and this is where we want to reduce the lighting loads, the heat transfer through the building envelope, before we start throwing things like high efficient HVAC systems at these buildings. Because if we don't reduce the load, we're just going to wind up with bigger, more efficient systems. So by reducing the load, we can actually reduce system sizes, improve performance, and reduce electrical demand, which is another great benefit of this. So this can be done early on in design. Um, as the project moves forward from schematic to design, uh, start looking at ways to reduce this load, um, improving the envelope, improving the lighting, improving the HVAC. One quote I want to leave you, because I guarantee you, you will not forget this. This is a quote by uh, John, Stro uh, John Straub, rather was a building science consultant. He says, you can pick your nose, you can pick your teeth, and you can pick your butt, but the order you do it in matters tremendously. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, we're looking at energy measures in a building. If you have a crappy building envelope and you want to throw high efficiency HVAC systems at it, you're doing that backwards. Look at the envelope first, work inside, reduce the load, and then look at the HVAC systems. Simple chart just to show this. Um, some different load reduction strategies. This is getting more into specifics, but um, looking at things like building, building uh, orientation, um, improving the envelope, uh, air leakage and air barriers, which is a big thing that I typically don't see architects really paying a lot of attention to, is air leakage through a building. They usually use rule of thumb measures for load calculations, and really have no idea what you're going to wind up with in design. Uh, look for opportunities for energy storage in, um, through thermal mass, as well as other passive strategies. Um, and then look at the design day conditions for heating. With the HVAC systems, and uh, Neil, just about one more minute, that should be done. Um, with the HVAC systems, again, look at designing environments, not just systems. Uh, consider occupant satisfaction, not just maintaining temperature control within a room, but look at things like occupant, occupant diversity, and in that case, we're looking for dress, body mass, activity, individual preferences, occupant controllability, Getting feedback from occupants is critical because this can identify um, areas where the system is not performing correctly or can be improved through operations and maintenance. Uh, high performance systems that can be applied once we've done load reduction and we've, we've looked at those other aspects of design. Heat recovery systems, heat pumps, whether it's air source or water source, and Jay's going to talk about geothermal systems, which would tie into the water source. And lastly, owners should require that the engineer or consultant does an ASHRAE thermal comfort assessment. And the thermal comfort assessment is going to look at all of the factors the building occupant um, takes in as an input to really determine how they perceive comfort. So metabolic rate, cooling insulation, air temperature, velocity, mean radiant temperature, and that's the temperature of surrounding surfaces within the room that will maybe create a draft effect or make, make people feel cold if they're sitting by an uninsulated window or wall, and then relative humidity. And one last piece that typically doesn't get looked at is get feedback from company policies and dress codes. Because if you're designing a system where you have 10 people in a room and three of them are required to wear suits, other could wear lighter materials, golf shirts, you will never get all of those people comfortable in the same room. And I've worked <laughs> in environments like that, and it just creates thermostat wars throughout the space. Everyone complains, and people start working from home. Um, <laughs> so target value design. The last piece of the puzzle here is we can only improve technology so much at this point. We're, we're getting to the point of diminishing returns, and this is based on uh, a chart put together by ASHRAE 90.1, which is the, the committee that makes standards for energy efficiency in commercial buildings. 
By about 2030, we're really not going to be able to reduce the amount of energy in a building through more efficient technologies. At that point, we need to bring in on-site generation, bring in the renewables to get that last 20% if we ever want to get to net zero buildings uh, at that point. Um, so, Bill, I think we're cutting you there. Yep. Commissioning is important. All this is important. You have your PowerPoint available to those that would like it. I'd love it. Thank you. And uh, great presentation. Let's keep it going. Jay, you're up next, and we all hear about geothermal. I thought that was something in Iceland, but we can have it in, in Long Island, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, it's a privilege. I sure will. It'll be better over there, right? Yeah, yeah, John. John usually knows what he's talking about. <laughs> so I'm gonna follow his lead here, and plus I can point. There you go. So thank you for doing the, the clicker, John. Um, geothermal systems are probably the most understood, but they probably have the greatest impact in building systems beyond putting together a tight building that you can have. <clears throat> the next slide. There are five things I want you to try to take away from this today because most of us don't know exactly what geothermal <laughs> systems do. You want to understand the verbiage a little bit, identify the fact that it's important, actually crucial to um, infrastructure and building construction. Um, it's also important to health and human safety for many reasons that we can't get into right here, but you'll kind of get a clue of a few of them as I go through this. And then the important part here is that we do, as people, as a community, as power companies, uh, elected officials, we have the ability to move this forward. It's happening, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end. And we need to leave here with the intent to go, yes, this works. We can apply this here in Long Island. So next slide, please, John. In a geothermal system, there are fundamentally three parts. There's a ground loop exchanger, which transfers heat to and from the earth. There's a heat pump or a chiller, or a heat pump chiller. It's a piece of equipment that does the lifting of the temperature to the temperature that's needed for the building, or the rejecting to make the building cool. And then there's a duct system or some other kind of distribution system. So in this room, for example, you have forced air. Some places have, uh, have uh, radiant floors. Next slide, please. Now, this is the most important thing fundamentally to understand. A, a heat pump does not produce heat any more than this water pump makes water spontaneously. You put a water pump in a borehole in the ground so you can pump water out of the ground into the building. That's the same thing for a heat pump. It does not create heat. There is no combustion, but it can make all the heat you need for a building, for an entire campus, for an airport, for a college. Next slide, please. The, the technology that goes into a heat pump is exactly the same as you have in a refrigerator. Now you think about a refrigerator in your kitchen, that cold kitchen in the, in the middle of the morning when you come to get that snack, if you have a kind like I do, the heat, you can feel it on your bare feet coming out the bottom. It's pumping heat out of the box and making that box 45 degrees in the main refrigerator and five degrees or zero degrees in the freezer. That's how a heat pump works. If you reversed it, you could make the box hot and it would blow cold out on your feet. So that's what a heat pump does. The important thing about hydronics, and I appreciate Bill bringing it up, water sourced equipment uh, is, a, is a much better way to move heat around. It's the most effective way to move BTUs around a building. As a matter of fact, a three quarter inch pipe can move as many BTUs as an eight by 14 inch duct and lose one tenth the energy doing it. So that's really important in distributed heat pump systems. Next slide, please, John. This is just the facts and the figures. <laughs> Speaking of ASHRAE, and, and Bill mentioned that several times, at the ASHRAE <coughs> building in Atlanta, they put geothermal system, a geothermal system on the first floor and an air source heat pump system on the top floor. This is how bad air source systems that they put in, this was state of the art in 2010, peak out in the middle of the winter and even don't have the efficiency in the summer, what the geothermal heat pump does is reduces demand and evens the load considerably. They're a very vital part of any infrastructure as you go to beneficial electrification. Next slide. This is an actual, I see Michael Volz back there. This is a national grid slide uh, where they showed this is their natural gas demand in the winter 
This is their electrical demand in the summer, and you can see it peaking. If you go all electric, the geothermal heat pump system will level the grid. What it does, what's so brilliant, is it gives the electric companies base load in the winter that they didn't have before, and it shaves the peak in the summer, which is super important, because if you shave the peak enough, you're not going to need to build new power plants for a while. This is two buildings in Oklahoma, just to show you what the air source building, right next to the identical geothermal heat pump building did. Next slide. This is, we're talking about carbon emissions and greenhouse gases. This just shows how green our grid is getting worldwide from 2020 up to 2050, according to the International <laughs> Energy Agency. This is emissions from Ontario, which is your neighbor up north, for a home per year for natural gas, propane, oil, then all electric, which is great, but if you go all electric with a geothermal heat pump, it's even 20% of all electric. Next slide, please. So this is what's happening in Massachusetts right now. Now, New York used to be ahead on this, but they have some super powerful action groups, including uh, a group called HEAT, and uh, another one called Mothers Out Front. It's in the legislature now, where Eversource has gone to the legislature, which is the partner to your company, they're the natural gas utility there. They've gone to the uh, Department of Public Utilities, and they've applied to do three geo grid systems, geo district grid systems, because they know that the way things are going, natural gas is on the way out, so they're looking to start at the, at the outer, outer end. The National Grid did one of these projects in PSEG right here on the island, I think, or somewhere near here. Patrick. But where is it? Uh, Patrick. Uh, river. 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 Right, river. River. right, river. right. It's in right. Riverhead. OK, good. So this is what they did here. This is what they're talking about doing. Because over in, um, in Massachusetts, they have $9 billion of infrastructure to replace in the next 20 years. Uh, natural gas pipes that are failing. So they're talking about taking these and starting to do the geothermal micro districts and retrofitting them back. Go ahead. One, one minute, Jerry. Okay, this is great because this is an official test, uh, an official um, uh, analysis done by Oak Ridge National Laboratories. They looked at geothermal heat pump penetration in the United States and determined, and you can get this online, it's 2010. Geothermal heat pumps will reduce peak demand by 56%. Remember how I talked about that? If you can do that, you won't have to build uh, power plants for a while because you're shaving the peak. That's why they have to build new power plants. And there's a 48% savings or reduction in electric bills across the board on that. So I'm going to go ahead and finish there. You can go to the next slide if I have a few seconds. This is just to show you all the different types of heat pumps. If you want to do a PTAC, if you want to do above the ceiling, commercial like in schools, um, Marriott hotels, residential, there's a heat pump for every application. They're, they're, they're basically off the shelf. We just have to put in the infrastructure. And that's it. Jay, great stuff. Right on the timer. Thank you. Perfect. Trace right, please. <laughs> and John, last but certainly not least, this is a very important part of this whole discussion, is where some of the incentives and financing. By the way, so today's conference, Smart Growth, we're talking mostly about new projects, new developments in downtowns and such. So uh, the points that Bill made and Jay made are really relevant to new construction. It's crazy to build a building the old-fashioned way it in 2020. It would be a stranded asset, especially if you're putting in new... And yet I can show you newly constructed buildings that are 100% uh, fossil fuel, don't have any solar on the roof, they're building just to the basic code. So this message really needs to get out to the folks that are in this room. So <laughs> the future is now. John? And we're yeah. from the utility, we're here to help. So there you go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Work for I know. I was wondering how he did it. You got to put the, the mouse clicker over the um, PowerPoint slide on the computer. I'll, I'll change it. All right. Thanks. And then hold the clicker. Just say, just say what. All right. All right. All right. So, starting now. To, to start off with the utility, like I said, we're here to help. We'll give you a little. This is called the energy of the future. That's what this. That's what this panel is called. And uh, to say where we're going in the future, we got to say, hey, what did we do so far? Where are we now? So we, we've been uh, supporting the offshore wind 
Uh, PSEG Wild does go out and build the windmills. Companies like Jennifer's go out and build the windmills. And uh, we're going to have 130 megawatts out of the North of the South Fork, uh, as Jennifer said, um, by the end of 2022. Get all those guys out in the boats, and there's going to be a lot of people out in the boats to do that. Uh, energy storage, uh, when you talk about intermittent type of um, assets, utility for the last 100 years has basically said, hey, uh, there's load out there, we need to supply the load, we have power plants, the power plants started with coal, then they went to oil, now they're using natural gas for the most part. Uh, the idea with the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act is to make that 100% renewable. So once the utility is 100% renewable, now we have intermittent types of supplies uh, in order to keep the energy flowing when the wind stops or if the sun is not shining, we need storage. So storage is going to be a big part too. And solo, we, we've been a pioneer from the Leo Lewis days on the, on the LIPA board. I mean, LIPA here on Long Island has been a pioneer on, on solar. I think we have the most solar, especially <coughs> density-wise, uh, you know, much more than the rest of the states, the rest of the state, uh, New York State. And, uh, and, and energy efficiency, we're a leader in energy efficiency too. 1.5% uh, doesn't sound like a lot of sales, but that's about two or three times any of the other utilities in the state of New York. So we know how to get things done here with the leadership of these people in this room and other people outside. Uh, on the island here, we got a lot of smart people, and these people uh, know what to do, and the utility is here to help that process. So just to show you that we can do what we say we can do, um, this is a great slide, and I use it, my people, my folks always use it too. Uh, I mean, you gotta say, well, what, what have you guys done? There's some programs out there, yeah, we see rebates for light bulbs, and I got some appliance rebates, and I see some solar panels out there, but what are you guys really doing? So we were able to lower the peak demand, significant amount. I mean, the way it was going back, uh, you know, back in 2013, the prediction was to have 7,500 almost um, megawatts. That's Just so people day. understand, the, the dates up there are the when those studies were right. done. So the, the 2013, so that's what they Back in 2013, we which said, is not hey, listen, that long ago. You know, the, the, the load is growing and it's going to just keep growing just like this. And we said, well, what do we do if we take almost $100 million a year of ratepayer money, which is not a big amount, uh, and put it towards energy efficiency. Uh, LED light bulbs, high efficient air conditioning, and all the other energy efficiency measures. And that's what we've been able to do. So if you think about the difference between 5,000 and 7,500, that's a couple of big power plants that we didn't need here on the line. So if you think we can't make the grid 100% renewable, this is what we did in, in a few short years. So we can, we can do this. Um, this is a slide that you saw uh, on Peter's deck. Um, has to do with the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Uh, the idea again is to get the grid from mostly fossil fuel over to 100% renewables. And to, to, to use beneficial electrification, which is where you're going to be hearing uh, quite, a, quite a bit now in the future. Things like geothermal, like heat pumps, instead of having fossil fuel burning at your facility or at your home. You make it 100% electric. Right now, most of the grid, like I said, is fossil fuel. But as the grid shifts by law over to 100% renewable in the future, if everybody's electric, then your home is 100% renewable. You don't have to burn fossil fuels in your house. And every grid that reduces the car. So when you say beneficial electrification, that's referring both to <coughs> electrifying the transportation system, right. but also looking at electrifying heating. Mm -hmm. And that's where geothermal and, and some and regular air source heat pumps, geothermal heat pumps, that's where it comes in. Okay. Landscaping equipment. And other right, well, we have, uh, we have rebates. It jumps ahead on me there, but uh, we do have rebates <laughs> for, now that Barge brought it up, we have rebates, and I don't think we, we, uh, I don't think we released them yet, but I think they're coming uh, right after January 1st, as soon as the staff, which is back working in the office hard on all these programs to roll them out for 2020. We have rebates on electric um, uh, battery operated lawn equipment, both commercial and residential. Um, we're introducing rebates on uh, electric forklifts. So if you know any of you guys have uh, big facilities with, electric, with uh, propane forklifts and you walk into your uh, warehouse every morning and you smell the, the smell of burning propane, um, we can switch that over to electric and have some rebates for that. And, all, and also for um, electric golf carts too. So we have a fleet of uh, gas guzzling golf carts, and you want to switch them over to electric, come see us, we have every day for that. Okay? So, we talked about the utility. Utility, as always, for the last hundred years, just generate a bunch of electricity, 
and match the load. The load goes up in the morning when everybody wakes up. It goes up even higher on a, on a, you know, uh, on a Friday afternoon when everybody goes home and uses their air conditioners in the summer. And buildings like this are still air conditioning. So we just build more infrastructure. And the utilities of the past have also been incentivized that for infrastructure. So the more money they spent on infrastructure, the more ratepayer money they got. So the idea is to try to get the utility to be more motivated to keep the load down and that's what we've done with these energy efficiency two Also, minutes. two minutes. Sure. Okay. Also, uh, things like electric vehicles. <coughs> talked about electric vehicles, so electrifying beneficial electrification for the transportation sector. Uh, your electric vehicle can hopefully be used for uh, for grid support. So when the grid says, "Hey, a lot of people with air conditioners on," hopefully the geothermal air conditioners, so the heat goes down. Uh, you're going to be able to supply the power back onto the grid, whether it's a power wall that you have for the energy store in your house or for uh, electric vehicles. So all this sounds a little bit difficult to achieve. Uh, it's gonna require a lot of co cooperation from the utility and it's gonna require a lot of uh, investment on the part of the consumer. <coughs> but ultimately, I think what happens is the utility rates can come down if you're not burning fossil fuels and you're using the grid a lot more efficiently. Right now, the grid is about, what was it, about 30, 40% uh, utilized. So you picture if you had a big hotel and it was only 30% utilized, you can make that 100% utilized. Uh, the cost for operating that hotel goes down quite a bit with the, the rates of cost. Uh, this is a, a slide on EV rebates. In addition to the $500 that you can get personally for your own house, uh, we also have for this particular facility um, that uh, Peter mentioned, the wife mentioned about the, the uh, EV charging stations here. Uh, we also have very big rebates for for commercial facilities to uh, offer rebate charging at their commercial facilities. Okay, so you see one of us in here. Okay. Uh, heat pump basics. They already hit on this, so I wasn't sure what the what the, what the order was going to be. Let's go back one more. Again, the. Uh, oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's easy. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> great day, great. Thanks. So um, again, heat pump just moves heat around. In the summertime, you're kind of taking, uh, and this is showing an air source heat pump. Jake kind of went over the ground source heat pumps and he was going to do that, which was good. I didn't really talk about that. But the air source heat pump is just an air conditioner working in reverse. Right in the summer, you got heat coming out of the outside unit and uh, heat being absorbed by the inside unit. And then in the winter, you reverse that process. The air source heat pumps. While they don't work as efficiently as Jay showed on this slide, uh, SOS heat pumps are quick and cheap. We have great rebates. We have up to $1,000 a ton for SOS heat pumps, and we have up to $2,000 a ton for geothermal heat pumps. Okay. And the next slide is just uh, contact info for us. It's way too much PSEG rebate stuff to talk about in seven minutes. But way too much, but so I have a question or two. So first is, we have a lot of businesses represented here today. You have organized an annual or a uh, conference, I know it took place this year, it took place a couple of years. Mm -hmm. How are you doing on getting businesses to come and learn about all these programs that are available? So we're doing a great job with um, the basic energy efficiency stuff. So the basic energy efficiency stuff, which is lighting. So we have businesses, if you look around, you see here with the LED lighting. The word's getting out that lighting word is, is getting easy out. way so to that's save the, money. That's the first, that's the low hanging fruit. Right. Um, but what happens is in utility business, our job is really to incentivize the adoption of that technology. So if you've been to Costco in the last week or two, you notice that the rebates we had on LED lighting, uh, the basic A A19 bulbs are not rebated anymore but the, uh, the special TR, the candle operas and, and uh, car lights. So what happens, Neil, is we've been incentivizing people to switch from old incandescent and fluorescent lighting go to LEDs. As they do more and more of that, you're gonna see less and less rebates. And the, the customers are, we had about three, 400 people um, uh, you know, at the conference, which was on Halloween a few, a few weeks ago. Very impressive. Um, and we do that every 18 months. We, can't, we try to do it every year. It's a lot, right? Just, <laughs> just like this conference, right? So um, yeah, we are seeing more and more people that, I mean, as we get the architects and engineers involved, we get, we get, the, uh, we get the local universities involved, we get large. Like, well, let's put them all on the spot. We have yeah. a lot of builders that, that are coming to this conference. Right. Are they taking advantage of your programs? Uh, some of them are. Some of them were very interested when they had the gas moratorium. They were talking about heat pumps and, and uh, geothermal uh, to, to, to put, in their, um, put in their buildings. We do have one great geothermal success story, the biggest one and the most uh, I guess prominent one I could think of is a 100 unit uh, multifamily building in Far Rockaway. It's called Beach Green, Beach Green Dunes, right? And that's 100% geo. So they drilled a whole bunch of holes in the ground, put plastic pipes in, and the whole facility, the whole building 
is all heated awesome. and cooled by uh, geothermal heat pumps. So these are great things happening, but my point is there's still a lot of business as usual construction going yeah, up right. all across Long Island. It's just crazy. Um, jobs. When it comes to the programs that you oversee, none of this work gets done without someone physically going into these buildings and putting in this new equipment. Right. So do you see this as also something that is a uh, an engine for creating jobs on the map? Absolutely, absolutely. We have we create. I think last time we looked, uh, I forgot the numbers were. Maybe Walter remembers. It was a it was a what, four or five hundred jobs, five six hundred jobs. Yeah. If you think about all the lighting contractors, there's there's uh, you know hundred or so lighting contracts that we deal with out here, contractors. Uh, geothermal contractors, uh, you know, other other engineers that are designing. And I should point out at the Sustainability Institute uh, that I work at in Lloyd College, we also uh, promote your the program for homeowners. We have a uh, home right. and yes. homes, and uh, PSEG has really been doing a great job for the homeowner renovation. Everybody in here that's a homeowner should know there's free energy audits available yep. for every homeowner. It's a very go. simple process. Um, you should take advantage of it. And the point is, in terms of jobs, you can't get that kind of work done in a house. Right. Someone going up in your ad, you can't like call on the phone to China and outsource it. You right. need local workers doing this work. Yeah, the geothermal workers out here are all local people. There aren't people coming from Pennsylvania and driving up here and, you know, and, and, and uh, doing those kind of installations. All local HVAC guys, all local home performance companies, a lot of them minority women owned businesses. These are all local I'm businesses. a strong believer that what we're talking about in this room is one of the best economic development engines on Long Island. People right. don't see that what we're talking about in terms of green energy is job creation. You heard it from Jennifer. I mean, this is tremendous in terms, and this, she's just one of the wind companies. So uh, I just want to make that connection to the job. Yeah, we, we collect what, basically what we do is we collect your money, the ratepayer money, we put it together. Every single penny that you pay on your PSEG Long Island bill gets put right back into these programs. It doesn't go upstate, it disappears somewhere. It's all put right back into Long Island with Long Island jobs. And we're helping you guys lower your electric bill. So, uh, you know, it all stays down here. And it's, an all, it's a great economic uh, development engine that we've developed. And the trick is to have good, robust programs and keep the programs going. You can't stop the programs because then people lose jobs and they, they fire people and then they never hire them back. In the so let's leave this uh, slide up. We've got a few minutes for uh, questions because uh, it's good to have John's name and contact info out there because many of you uh, should perhaps be reaching out to him. Um, uh, but let's take a few. Uh, let me throw one question to the panel just real quick. We have a new legislation that set all these really dramatic goals. You want, uh, really dramatic goals. Have, has that correlated to more interest in your business? Clearly with wind that has to be the case because the goal is direct, you know, directly impacting you. Um, but what about with geothermal? geothermal? What about with green buildings? Geothermal is huge because the workforce development on the ground is, uh, the DOE just came out with a report, clearly geothermal has the most long lasting jobs as a result. And one of the really great things about it is as the natural gas companies start converting over to geo micro districts, that keeps those workers working just piping renewable fluid, water based fluid, instead of um, natural gas. So it keeps the infrastructure. Hey, uh, Bill, I mean, is the message getting out in terms of these major policy uh, initiatives, or do we just go back to business as usual the next day? I, I think it is in New York City because of specific lo uh, legislation local to that area. I haven't seen the same impact outside of New York City. Um, the Climate Leadership Protection Act in and of itself that was just passed, it doesn't, it's, it's legislation with no team at that point. There's no timeline, there's no penalties, there's nothing documented, but um, through some of the other organizations I'm a part of, I think it's information from the Department of uh, Environmental Conservation that shows that New York State is looking to have some uh, requirements for greenhouse gas penalties, emission penalties by 2024 statewide. So the fact of the matter, this is real, and I can say that with uh, one client in particular that is in the skilled nursing industry, they have a new development going up in New Paltz. The original plan was, uh, there's no site utilities there too, the original plan was oil-fired boilers and bringing electric in for chillers, and we had a conversation about where this legislation is going long term, and that kind of piqued their interest, because now it's like, well, this is real, we don't want to get hit with these penalties, we need to look at this now rather than 10 years from now where it's going to be a major issue. So, so now, so, so the message is getting out, but it's not, not everybody's got the message. So yes, it, we, said, we need, right. that's part of what the purpose of conferences like this are. These are dramatic changes in our entire 
you know, and, and our energy future is now. I mean, this is happening now. Yes, it's going to be like a four-year implementation of that law. So you're right, the teeth aren't uh, in place yet. Um, uh, Jennifer, I know that uh, there was a lot of concern of community opposition to offshore wind. I was involved in the initial proposal some 10 or so years ago where they were only three miles out, and so the concern was about visual impact. Now you're so far out that the visual impact is almost uh, nothing. In some, in some of your projects, it is nothing. Um, but you're still getting some community opposition. Do you want to just say a word or two about how the community is receiving this proposal? I mean, you know, these are these are big project, these projects are complex projects. There's no such thing as a project without opposition. But I will say that it's going to take, you know, we're going to have to agree collectively that, you know, offshore wind, we can't, we can't meet our climate goals, our energy goals without offshore wind. Just the way we are built here in New York City, the amount of power that we need to, a, a renewable power that we need to be able to access, this is like a mission critical piece of the puzzle. So if we're all agreed that we want to hit these goals, we have to also work together to help get these projects over the finish line. And so, I mean, projects are, I mean, I've, I've worked in you know community outreach for a long time. I've never heard of a project without any level of opposition, even down to like the smallest projects. Obviously it gets amplified and politicized and stuff depending on, on where and how you're going. But there's, I mean, A, there's a lot of benefits that come with this. I mean, we are, Bringing, you know, we're bringing infrastructure to the community, but it's buried. It's all underground, so it's not like we're bringing you eyesores to the area. Um, it, they're revenue generators, you know, so there's going to be tax benefits. There'll be associated community benefits. Um, you know, focus on the positive, and you know, we just we just have to agree that we all have to come at this together and say we're standing up for this, and you know, work together to design the best possible projects. Um, we can't, you know, sometimes we, we face a little bit of like NIMBY NIMBY style opposition. Just hey, can't you just take this project? We can't do that anymore. We work hard to try and find the best places to land our cables, and we, we do count on the community to help us get these over the finish line because these so, are the goals that we want to achieve together. So I want to take a moment to, um, uh, to, to do a quick advertisement for one of my initiatives. We run a project called the Long Island Clean Energy Leadership Task Force. Jennifer presented at one of our um, meetings uh, in 2019. Mike Books, who was uh, shouted out to earlier, also presented. Um, Jay, we're uh, working on getting him at an upcoming meeting to present. Um, and the topic of New York stretch coach, which came up, was at our last meeting. Uh, and we've been working on commercial pace. So it's going to be a whole effort to push um, both commercial pace in 2020 so that businesses learn that they can finance uh, renovations of their old buildings as clean, upgraded uh, energy systems um, through a system that is really uh, lower cost and more uh, uh, business convenient. Uh, I'll leave it there without getting into finance stuff that gets boring, but um, it's important to know that new tool is available. And we're also pushing the idea, I'm going to try this effort again, uh, we did a white paper from the Sustainability Institute saying all new building construction on Long Island should have solar on commercial buildings that it's ridiculous in this day and age, um, and I can see, I can show you buildings, newly constructed, modern, multi-million dollar buildings that have not a stitch of solar, and they're built to the code's minimal standards. So, um, just wanted to give a shout out, anybody in here that'd like to follow up project, we meet like three times a year, please just give me a business card before you leave. With all that said, is there a really awesome question in the audience? Yes, I'm right here in front, shout out. Awesome, I'm really interested in Absolutely. You need to know that the um, standards, I'm, I'm on the International uh, Standards Committee for uh, the geothermal portion for 2021, and we just came out with 2018. And it's all about keeping the aquifers safe. It's about sealing the confining layers, and it's about making certain, and even the fluids that go in the water, the antifreezes have to be uh, approved. Uh, as, as something that won't contaminate practically FDA standards. <coughs> and a closed loop system is completely confined in the sense that it's not interacting with the right. Water. It's just uh, it's just a thermal it's just a thermal transfer through the through the materials. Now there are actually systems that exchange uh, fluid with rivers and aquifers, but those are in larger larger systems. We're working on a, pro a project for a Mather Hospital in Port Jefferson that will be exchanging uh, fluid with the uh, Magathy Aquifer, but that's th that. Those are usually on larger, highly engineered systems. Great question. Yes. Uh, yeah, I am. I'm Assemblywoman Judy Griffin, and I'm on the Environmental Committee. 
So I'm interested, I'll give you my cards to uh, learn like anything we can do in the legislature to promote this, to promote clean energy, to promote the growth of your companies, companies like yours. Um, you know, we have, uh, I'm happy that we passed the CCPA, but as you say, we don't have enough standards in place like to maybe to promote it a little further, like penalties or trying to say you have to have some component of solar energy or some green energy to any new building. So if you have any suggestions right now, or I'll give you my card down the road, if you have any suggestions, I'd love to hear Great, thanks for participating. Great stuff. Yes, we're running out of time, so you gotta keep them quick. Go ahead. For communities of color, that's job development. Where, in terms of um, education, uh, is Suffolk Community Colleges or the Community Colleges doing the job? There she is right so, there. So that's like a segue to Marge. And <laughs> I should also point out United Way has done a project of training people that will do a lot of these renovations. But Marge, you want to? Right. So uh, Marge is from Farmingdale State College. We do have a geothermal solar PV program and very soon an offshore wind operation and maintenance program. Um, for the geothermal program, I'm working with um, Senator Sanders and South um, Queens, okay. and we're getting uh, high school students from uh, uh, communities of, of color uh, in um, HV a program, which is HVAC followed by geothermal. So we're doing that. We're hoping to be doing that for offshore wind, although it's a little bit more difficult to recruit people from high school for offshore wind, but we're working with Suffolk Community College, that's a community college to kind of build a pipeline. Um, as far as geothermal, I know there was a question there. We do have, and thanks to PSEG support, that have supported our, our, our geothermal program, but we do have a geothermal trainer, which is a demonstration system. It's in a room, and any one of you, I invite you to come into our lab, and you'll see exactly how it works, and just to see how the heat exchange works on both ends. And as well as, you know, closed loop, you know, open loop, so you, you'll get a real feeling for what's happening underground, but you'll see it in the training form. If I was to ask you about how the state legislation has impacted things, you're doing a lot of job training now. There's Absolutely. a lot of excitement, right? Absolutely. They're doing a lot of job training, and any job training is removable areas. Uh, please approach me, and, you know, we can talk. If there's a special thing that you need also, we have, I do have a, a SUNY funded performance improvement program, and I have lots of money to spend between now and June, so I'm more than willing to help out. <laughs> so closing thoughts, <laughs> did you want to say anything, Bill? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that we're living in very interesting times. Not only is, it, is the danger from climate change very palpable and, very, and here as we speak, but we also have the technology to avert the worst of it and the technology actually provides economic benefits as well. So the question each of you must deal with is, do you want to be the last one to build an old-fashioned building or buy a gas-powered automobile, or do you want to be a leader in the, in the new forward-looking renewable energy technology? I, I just got the, the uh, cut yeah, on the door. Uh, I think that's an awesome point to end on. Uh, thank you to the